Okay, this will be the third and final portion of the Chapter 6 Cellular Respiration Lecture. And this is where I left off. I'm just going to warn you that the next slide is very text intensive, um, but I will, I'll just read what I have on this, on the next slide and explain it, and then I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is basically a visual representation of all of this text. Okay, so we're still talking about the electron transport chain. This is the third and final stage of cellular respiration. Um, can you all remember what the ultimate goal of cellular respiration is? The end goal of cellular respiration is simply to generate ATP for cellular work. So we're taking in energy in the form of food, um, and we're going to make ATP from those raw ingredients, and that is what cellular respiration does. So remember we have these relay racers here passing the electrons, which, which can be thought of as the baton in a relay race. These two runners or molecules in this chain, NADH and FADH2, transfer the electrons to the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain uses the energy supply um, that it gets from that transfer of electrons to pump hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember, it's just that membrane within the mitochondria, and it's going to be pumping hydrogen ions across that membrane. Remember that oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and it has a very strong pull on electrons. So oxygen is what is ultimately causing that pull of electrons down this chain, and the subsequent release of energy. The hydrogen ions that are concentrated on one side of the membrane tend to want to rush back down their concentration gradient through an ATP synthase which is a special enzyme, which is within that mitochondrial membrane. Um, because we're creating this hydrogen ion um, concentration difference on either side of the membrane, those hydrogen ions are going to want to flow back down to where they are not as plentiful in order to even themselves out. So this is just thinking about the concept of diffusion and where things will naturally want to go. So because they're rushing back down their concentration gradient, they have to go through this ATP synthase molecule within that inner membrane, and that causes a part of the ATP synthase molecule to spin, just like turbines in a dam would spin. So this is actually what is creating um, the energy supply here. The rotation of the ATP synthase activates part of the synthase molecule that attach phosphate groups to ADP in order to generate ATP. So because those hydrogen ions are rushing through this basically a gateway here between the membrane, that causes a spinning of a portion of the ATP synthase molecule that spinning in turn activates part of the molecule that is then able to attach phosphate groups to ADP in order to generate ATP. So remember, all you have to do to get ATP from ADP is attach another phosphate group to it. And because of this action of the ATP synthase molecule, ADP becomes ATP again, and ATP is that universal source of energy for the cells. Okay, so again, we're just talking about the electron transport chain. This is a visual representation of everything that I just talked about. Here we have these electron acceptor molecules, 
these individual circles or spheres are the electron acceptors. Um, and this whole unit here is a protein complex. So electron carrier, protein complex. Um, you don't have to worry too much about the individual um, molecules here, but remember that there is a flow of electrons down this chain. Um, this ultimately creates a concentration um, gradient or difference between the inside or between the inside and the outside here because there are more hydrogen ions in the space between the membranes out here they're going to want to rush back in and that is what is going to be causing these ATP synthase molecules to rotate and that in turn allows a phosphate group to attach to ADP to create ATP. So this whole process here is actually what generates energy for your cells to do work. Okay, so um, what is the big picture here? There are 28 ATP molecules approximately um, produced for every molecule of glucose that your body takes in. So we have about 28 ATP molecules as well as water being produced here. And as a recap, the total products are um, two ATP molecules by direct synthesis in the glycolysis, glycolysis stage of cellular respiration. Pyruvic acid is going to um, help with the formation of acetyl COA or coenzyme A which needs um, to enter the citric acid cycle. That citric acid cycle produces two ATP molecules by direct synthesis and then the electron transport chain, that final step in this process is what produces the bulk of the ATP molecules. It's going to produce about 28 ATPs um, via ATP synthase. So per glucose molecule you take in, you, you can produce about 32 ATP molecules. You're also going to produce CO2 as a byproduct as well as water. And just to inform you here, um, it's not like glucose is the only form of chemical energy that can produce ATP. You have many different um, types of chemical energy here and they are going to enter the cycle at various places as indicated by these arrows. And ultimately all of these types of foods can contribute to the production of ATP in your body. So what happens when oxygen is not present? So what happens, um, for example, when you uh, have exhausted yourself, you, your blood can no longer supply enough oxygen for your body to make all of this ATP aerobically, fermentation is going to occur. And you can still harvest some ATP via this um, method, but it's not nearly as efficient. So under strenuous conditions, your cells will spend ATP faster than your bloodstream can deliver oxygen. And if you don't have oxygen, you can't undergo um, cellular respiration because remember oxygen is that final electron acceptor and if oxygen is not there it's not going to create that pull and it's not going to be able to generate ATP. After you are deprived of oxygen for about 15 seconds your muscle cells begin to generate ATP via fermentation which relies on glycolysis and the steps in this glycolytic cycle are slightly different um, from the steps that I've just described, but I don't need 
I don't need you to know the details of that. Um, just know that glycolysis can produce those two ATP molecules um, because oxygen is not required in the glycolytic phase. And before I get to that last slide there, um, we also rely on fermentation for the production of um, ethyl alcohol. So fermentation will result in our own cells producing lactic acid as a byproduct and fermentation is going to produce ethyl alcohol um, within microorganisms that can produce um, fermented products like beer and wine. Um, also, when you have bread rising, all of those bubbles within that bread dough are caused by CO2. So those were actually originally CO2 bubbles and that's um, caused by the fermentation of yeast. Okay, so remember glycolysis can take place without oxygen and um, because of that it was really basically the only way for cellular respiration to occur on this planet before the presence of an appreciable amount of atmospheric oxygen. So um, atmospheric oxygen didn't appear on the planet until about 2.7 billion years ago and before that between um, the oldest prokaryotic fossils and the appearance of atmospheric oxygen those early organisms had to rely on glycolysis. So glycolysis occurs in almost all living organisms and that attests to the fact that it evolved um, very early on on our planet. Alright, so that is the conclusion of the Chapter 6 lecture on cellular respiration. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, do consult your syllabus for the relevant information regarding assignments and um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for listening.